The following podcast contains explicit language. You know, she's got this goofy friend named Elizabeth Warren. She goes, and Donald Trump is a terrible person. She gets nothing done, nothing passed. She's got a big mouth. That's the best you could come up with? Calling on Donald Trump for help is like if your house is on fire, calling an arsonist. Hello and welcome to Trumpcast, the show about the man who donated an outdoor slum to New York State and called it Donald J. Trump State Park. I'm Jacob Weisberg. So one of the subjects that has obsessed me since I started doing this show is Trump's relationship with Putin. I've had Frank Ford on twice. Frank Ford did the big piece about Trump's campaign manager, Paul Manafort, and his links to Vladimir Putin. We also had Masha Gessen on to talk about why Putin favors Trump over Clinton. And I feel like that has all come to fruition now with this outrageous story about the Russian hack of the Democratic National Committee and the evidence that Vladimir Putin has tried to intervene in the United States election. To talk about the DNC hack and Trump's relationship with Putin, I have on the show today Ann Applebaum, the Pulitzer Prize winning writer and Washington Post columnist. But first, let's do the tweets. The Bernie Sanders supporters are furious with the choice of Tim Kaine, who represents the opposite of what Bernie stands for. Philly fight? Is it the same Kaine that took hundreds of thousands of dollars in gifts while governor of Virginia and didn't get indicted while Bob M. did? Tim Kaine is, and always has been, owned by the banks. Bernie supporters are outraged. Was their last choice, Bernie fought for nothing. Pocahontas wanted VP slot so badly, but wasn't chosen because she has done nothing in the Senate. Also, crooked Hillary hates her. Leaked emails of DNC show plans to destroy Bernie Sanders, mocking his heritage and more. Online from WikiLeaks, really vicious, rigged. The WikiLeaks email released today was so bad to Sanders that it will make it impossible for him to support her unless he is a fraud. My guest today is Ann Applebaum. She's a columnist for The Washington Post and the author of books including Iron Curtain and Gulag. She's currently working on a book about Ukraine. Ann, welcome to Trumpcast. Uh, thanks for having me. So I have to say, you have been the person I know who has been talking about this the longest, this being Putin's intervention in the elections of democratic countries. Uh, yes, it is something I've been talking about for a long time, um, not always getting a huge amount of attention for it. But yes, there is a, there is a pattern now. Um, it's established of different kinds of interventions, whether through open funding. Uh, R- uh, Russia openly funds Marine Le Pen, who's a far-right leader in France, or through uh, hacking and email leaks and uh, taping scandals which have unfolded in several East European countries. Um, The interesting thing about Russia's intervention in in other elections is that it's very tailored to the particular country. It's not ideological. Um, In other words, in the olden days, you know, the Soviet Union supported communist parties all over Europe and all over the world. And now it looks like the pattern is that Russia intervenes in order to create disruption and chaos in Western democracies, thereby to weaken them, thereby to weaken the European Union and NATO. Um, and, of course, it hadn't, it hadn't really, if I'm honest, it hadn't really occurred to me that the U.S. electoral system was weak enough for the Russians to be able to influence it, but it looks like almost exactly the same pattern is now in play in the United States that we've seen play out in other European countries. Did you think the Russians would go this far, that they would try to, to have an impact on an election in the United States? 
You know, I didn't think about the United States because I thought the United States is too big and, you know, that American politics isn't moved by these smaller amounts of money the way that, you know, Czech politics are or Polish politics or, or fringe websites. It's another thing that Russia does is it funds extremist websites and extremist um, bloggers and, and um, Twitter trolls. And I just didn't think it could make that big a difference in the United States, which is so big. But I hadn't thought through the idea that, of course, through hacking, which is something they're, you know, very famously very good at, that they could try and disrupt a campaign. And, of course, the pattern of this, again, is something that we've seen before. You know, there's a big leak. It's right on an important political moment. It affects the way people think about the campaign. And, of course, instead of focusing on who did the leak and whose interest it's in, everybody focuses on the details, what's in the emails, you know, what did so-and-so write to so-and-so on December 27th, and that's all that gets reported. Um, but, I, but, no, I didn't think they would – I didn't think it could be done in the United States, but, yes, obviously they've done it. You said a moment ago that you think Russia basically is making mischief in, in other countries' elections. But here it certainly looks like there's an ideological alignment, particularly on the issue of pulling out of NATO. I mean, last week, Trump gave an interview where he said, as you know, that the, the NATO alliance is somehow contingent on whether he thinks uh, other countries have done their fair share. Yes, no, I meant not ideological in the sense that Russia will back the far right in some countries, it'll back the far left in other countries, um, and clearly in the United States, Russia is backing Donald Trump, who's hard for me to tell you what he is exactly, but he doesn't fall into any classic political categories. But no, they're, they're, they're certainly backing him um, because he aligns with their interests, I would say that. Um, and he does that in a number of ways. Um, number one is that he that he, he, as you say, he's been very skeptical of NATO and also actually of other U.S. alliances all around the world. Number two is that he has deep business connections to Russia, and the Russians like having relationships with people who they have some money linked to. They like, they like knowing stuff about people. They like having what they would call compromise or details about people. And, you know, I'm not saying they have anything specific on Trump, but they, all, they know a lot about him because he's been operating there as a businessman. Uh, they also like him because he has working for him directly somebody who they know very well. His campaign manager is Paul Manafort, who was for many years uh, working in Ukraine on behalf of Viktor Yanukovych, who was the pro-Russian president of Ukraine who, was, who escaped Ukraine after the Maidan revolution in 2014. And Manafort knows very well all these tactics. He used them in Ukraine. Uh, this, is, this is very much Ukrainian-style politics, you know, nasty leaks, Twitter trolls, um, uh, use of thugs at meetings. I mean, this is all very, this is all very East European. And of course, Manafort himself has deep links to Russian and Ukrainian oligarchs, and therefore to, you know, via them to the Kremlin. So the the idea that they would want Donald Trump as president is not remotely surprising. I mean, it's 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 not even secret. You know, you don't need to be conspiratorial minded to see it. You know, he's he's got these connections. He's got these political views that they like. Um, and he has he's surrounded by people that they know. But even from the beginning of, of the campaign, Trump's positive comments about Putin have stood out as shocking among a litany of shocking things he said. I mean, from the beginning, this admiration of Putin as a strong leader. I mean, it, it did jump out because he doesn't seem to just like Putin the way he likes other people with authoritarian or dictatorial instincts. He really seems to have a relationship with him. I think he admires Putin because Putin is what he aspires to be. You know, Putin is on the one hand an um, extremely wealthy man who's the head of what is in effect a kind of criminal empire. Um, he has no opposition. He has tamed the media. He has, you know, he controls business. Um, he, and he, he's somebody who's combined business and politics and who, you know, is surrounded by people who who operate the same way in a way that Trump clearly aspires to. You know, it's this combination of, you know, mixing your business interests with your political interests that's so typical of, of the post-Soviet world. And, you know, I think Putin is in some ways the role model for Trump. You know, it's not like he aspires to be a kind of ascetic Chinese secretive, you know, Mandarin, you know, or, a, you know, he really wants to be Putin. And, and, the, and the, even the aesthetically, you know, the vulgarity of the Russian oligarchy, the kinds of houses they live in, you know, they're a lot richer than Trump, actually, as well. So he may aspire to that, too. Uh, <laughs> the kinds of women they're surrounded by, the way, you know, the way they live, 
this is what Trump wants to be, you know, and, and so I think it makes a lot of sense that he admires Putin. So if Trump Tower seems a little tasteful to you, that you can go the oligarch route. Yes, exactly. I mean, Trump Tower is a um, is a beacon of aesthetic appeal by comparison to what the oligarchs build, you know, in their so-called cottages outside of Moscow. So, you know, he fits right into their um, to their aesthetic. He fits right into the way they think and the way they act. And except that they're, of course, more powerful than he is. And, you know, he aspires to be more powerful and therefore he aspires to be like them. It's also worth pointing out, Anne, that they're his biggest investors now. American banks don't lend Trump money anymore because he stiffed them all when he went bankrupt. His biggest investors are Russian oligarchs allied with Putin. Yes. I mean, this is something I hadn't fully realized until recently, the degree to which he his business seems to survive on Russian money. Um, and including some rather dodgy Russian money, there was a description of one of his companies, or one of the one of the companies that he was using in that I read recently, that described how money would sort of suddenly appear from Kazakh bank accounts um, to keep it going. And you know, that's boy, do I recognize that. That's a that's a way in which um, business is done in the former Soviet Union. So, so that you know, the, this brings me back to my earlier point. This, of course, is what the Russians like about him. You know, that he owes them something. He's entangled with them. He's, you know, they know stuff about him. They know details about him. You know, this week they're leaking stuff about the DNC that they hacked. But of course, if they want to control Trump, they might try and leak something about him. You know, that's, that's how they think. And so when they think about him, they think, aha, here's somebody we have something on. Here's somebody we can find a way to use. One more incredibly sinister tidbit, which was from the Republican convention last week. Trump didn't care about anything in the platform, but he made a big point of getting removed the plank that had been there from before that said Republicans supported helping Crimea resist the Russian invasion. He got that taken out. Uh, Yeah, I have to tell you, when I saw that, kind of alarm bells went off. When I saw that very specific thing being done, particularly given that the um, the Trump campaign was apparently not that much interested in the rest of the platform, most of which is far more conservative than anything that you know he stands for. Um, but when I saw that they were specifically interested in that, I thought, aha! Either they're trying to show someone in Moscow, look what we can do. They're trying to prove, look, we really have influence, so you can go on helping us. Or there's someone on his staff who, you know, genuinely believes that and wants to push it through. But it's a, it is absolutely not normal that this would be. And, and if you think about it, in the grand context of American politics, you know, Ukraine is not very important. And I say that as a person who writes, I'm writing a book about Ukraine. But the fact that they would, that that's the only issue they care about, you know, why? What, you know, what could be the reason for that unless they are, doing somebody a favor or showing somebody how important they are. I mean, given our history, one is very hesitant to start to use phrases like uh, dupe or, or stooge or tool or agent. But boy, it was hard to not think the phrase Manchurian candidate when you heard that story. I, I thought of it immediately. But of course, the weird thing is that, you know, the Manchurian candidate, if you remember the plot, you know, it involves somebody being hypnotized right. and lots of secret stuff. You know, this is actually all very open. You know, the relationship of Trump to Russia has been reported on and, you know, the, the activity on the, to, to change the Republican platform happened openly and the, the, the Russia and uh, uh, Trump's support for Russian policy, you know, Russia's views of NATO and its views of Europe have been stated. You know, so it's not like this is a secret. You know, what I'm describing isn't a kind of deep conspiracy. You know, you don't have to believe in you know, something very, you know, something very, very mystical and weird in order to see what's happening. It's, ha- it's absolutely unfolding in public. It's a kind of postmodern version of the Manchurian candidate. You know, it's the Manchurian candidate. Everybody knows it and nobody's reacting. If a, if a Democrat did this, I mean, Obama would be vilified for being a little soft on Putin at an ordinary Republican convention. And here you have a Republican nominee who is completely capitulating for what look like personal financial reasons. And it doesn't actually seem like anybody cares. Uh, No, it doesn't. Certainly doesn't seem like the Republican Party cares, which um, is mystifying given the historical record of the Republican Party. But I'm wondering whether the television stations care. I mean, the, in the last couple of days, as it's become clear that this is a last 48 hours, that this leak is coming from Russia, I'm waiting for shock horror. I'm waiting for, um, 
you know, television announcers to begin talking about it. And actually, of course, they're not. They're focusing on the details of the league and, as I said, who wrote what to whom on December 27th, which is, of course, what the Russians knew would happen because this is what always happens when these things are leaked. There was a, it was different, but a kind of parallel story in Poland with leaked secret tapes. And once again, nobody was asking where the tapes come from or why they mysteriously appeared at this particular moment, why they reappeared at the time of the election campaign. People were just, you know, wanted to know what was in them. And that's, that's human nature, and that's also the nature of the modern media. You know, it's very focused on sensational detail, and it's not focused on the bigger issue and the question of why this is happening now. Right. The same thing happened with the Sony hack. Nobody particularly cared that they were serving the interests of North Korea by, by transmitting the the personal data that was breached, even though in that case, there was no larger political import at all. No, no, but I mean, but you're, you're right. It's the same thing. You know, people are, people got interested in, you know, never mind that emails between people are private and they're supposed to, there is, should be space in the world for private conversation and private, private messages. But, you know, that's once something is leaked, it becomes public property. And also remember, things look different. You know, an email that you write a friend in, a, in the course of a kind of jokey exchange can look very different when printed, you know, in a newspaper. It simply looks the same thing with a private conversation. You know, the, all kinds of nuances in, are lost when you print something that was meant, you know, meant as a private, as a, as a private talk. And the fact is that people simply aren't, you know, people focus on the sensational aspect of it. They insist on reading things in the worst way, and they don't. The idea that even public figures or people who work for Sony should have privacy um, is being lost. We sort of skipped over, Anne, the question of proof or evidence that Putin or the Russian military intelligence is behind this. Do you have any doubt about that, and how do we know for sure? So all I know is what, you know, I've been reading about it. I started reading about it. the, The original hack of the DNC was announced, I think it was in June. And I talked to some people at the time who were, you know, who were examining it, and they were, they really had no doubt that it was Russia. Um, I don't know that in the course of this, you know, I'd have to sit down and go through the, the various articles and the various emails I've exchanged with people to, you know, to back it up. But the, as I understand it, you know, the, there are clues both from the kind of software that was used or rather the malware that was used that link it to Russia. There's Russian there's literally Russian writing inside some of the code. Um, the, 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 co- the companies that were used to do it or the, the organizations that were used to do it have been used before, and the software has been used before in other hacks that are related to Russia. You know, there's a sort of series of things that add up that pointed pretty directly to Russia. And there was, there was this kind of false flag operation to blame the earlier leak on somebody called Guccifer, who claimed to be Romanian. But doesn't, um, doesn't speak it, Romanian that fluently. Then it turned out he didn't speak Romanian, so that <laughs> seemed like maybe um, uh, maybe a, what we, you know a, a phony operation to throw people off the scent that it was in fact the Russians. But you know there aren't that many. Well, you know there are there are a lot of people who could do this, but the question is who would do it, and you know the other, of course, the other piece of it is who would do it and who would give it to WikiLeaks. Um, and there's now, and uh, once again, it's mostly circum. This is more circumstantial, but there's a lot, enormous number of links now between Russia and WikiLeaks, and there's enormous number of material that WikiLeaks has had access to that seems to come from Russia. Their clear interest in getting Edward Snowden to Russia when he came out of China, you know, a few years ago, uh, has also linked them to that. I mean, I've actually been attacked by Assange in a very weird way for things that I've written about Russia, which make me suspicious of him and because I write about Russia. So the you know the WikiLeaks is like an additional, you know, an additional suspicious thing, but as I say the the experts who've looked at it and there's sort of four or five different you know organizations who've looked at the who've looked at the hack all think that it comes from Russia. I think the FBI is now investigating and we should get a report on it soon. Anne Applebaum is a columnist at the Washington Post and the author of several books that I can't recommend highly enough. Anne, it was great having you on the show. Thanks, Jacob. That's it for today's show. Trumpcast is produced by Jason DeLeon with an assist from Dan Bloom. Thank you, Dan. Steve Lichtai is the executive producer of Slate Podcast. Andy Bowers is our chief content officer. Special thanks, as always, to John D. Domenico, our voice of Donald Trump. I'm Jacob Weisberg. Thanks for listening to Trumpcast.
the Democrats are in a total meltdown. But the biased media will say how great they are doing. Emails say the rigged system is alive and well. In every city, she encouraged them to enjoy what she called the cheerful hurly-burly of city life. In every town. And now we've just been around long enough, and the town looks so much better. There are people who want to change things. And I thought, oh my gosh, that is so cool. Why can't we do that in my community and other communities everywhere? To make them better. My point to them is... It can be better. It can be better than that. It'll be different. Or to protect things from getting worse. If you're a responsible person, you have to oppose things that are dumped right on your neighborhood, right in an area that you know about. I'm Rebecca Shear, inviting you to check out Placemakers, the podcast from Slate Magazine about the spaces we inhabit and the people who shape them. Subscribe now to Placemakers. You'll never look at your community the same way again.